Hey fellow babies, welcome back to Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. Uh, I'm hopeful that you are watching us on Sifted and you're a Patreon patron. If so, thank you so much. If you are not a Patreon patron, you're watching it on YouTube, you're getting it a week late. And we understand if you don't have the money or the inclination to spend money on Patreon, uh, at a minimum, please try to link your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. The instructions are in the description for the show. We get a couple of bucks a month from Amazon. It costs you nothing. So link the accounts that's doing us a favor, keeping us alive and keeping the production still going so Shane can afford to keep going. The day he quits doing this and starts getting a job, you're going to stop getting factor factors from me. Our first question this week from YouTube from Christian. Under what scenario do you see streaming services like Stadia and xCloud succeeding? Which service do you think will end up being the winner? Well, you know, I think that they're going to be the same. And um, I don't think it matters. So I think that they're just alternate distribution methods for games. They're bypassing the console. Uh, I think Stadia has an odd business model. The first one that they announced, which is the you know, buy a $170 package and you get a controller and a Chromecast stick and three months subscription to a $10 service and a three month free companion pass. So I guess you're paying 110 for um, hardware and you can give your friend $30 worth of value yourself. I don't see a lot of value in being a Stadia member at that level. Um, you do get 4K streaming and I get that but you know the, the truth is, if you wait to next year, the base package is 1080p and it's free. So why are you paying 10 bucks a month? And if you think about the $170 entry fee and 10 bucks a month, then eight months after your initial three months expire, so 11 months in, you've spent 250 bucks. And guess what? That's what a PlayStation and Xbox cost. I think nominally the Xbox is is uh, 299 but they're always 249 and the PlayStation probably the same, but they're always discounted down to 249 So what kind of a person who doesn't have a console yet is willing to spend the same as a console cost for a streaming service that gets them nothing more than what a console gets them? I don't get it. Now you can argue that you'll have multiplayer gaming on Stadia or xCloud and that you're gonna end up saving the five bucks a month. So I get that. So instead of 11 months, you know, to be break even, it's more like you know, 19 months or something before you're at the same cost as a console. I still don't get it. I think, you know, people aren't gonna do this and pay that kind of money. Um, I do think the base package is pretty interesting. And with that, you know, you get, you buy a controller, obviously, and a Chromecast stick. But a lot of people have Chromecast sticks. You buy a controller, even at 69 bucks, and then you can buy whatever game you want. So 69 bucks entry fee instead of buying a console, um, not bad. And I think after a while, there'll be aftermarket controllers that'll, that'll do that. Um, I would wait for the Amazon service, because I think they're gonna probably make the controllers super cheap for everybody and try to encourage you. But at the end of the day, it's a storefront. And the winners are the guys who sell a lot of games either through the Xbox Live or PlayStation Network services and who sell a lot of stuff at GameStop and Walmart. Uh, they're just gonna have a new way to sell stuff to people who don't have a console. So the real winners are Activision, EA, Take-Two, Ubisoft. And you know, ultimately, I think the consumer wins because you're removing the paywall, the barrier to entry of a console purchase. Um, so I think the more of these services uh, there are, the better for the consumer. You should you know, think about this. How do you watch movies on demand? And the answer is, you don't care. You might watch them on Netflix, you might watch them on Amazon Prime Video, you might watch them on Hulu, you might watch them on Apple TV, you might watch them on Comcast or DirecTV. It doesn't matter. And if you're talking about watching like a, a recent release movie, like say Avengers Infinity War from last year, you can pretty much watch that for $5.99 on about 10 different services and you shouldn't care. So the point is, if I say to you, how are you gonna buy a game? I don't think anybody cares if you buy it at Walmart, Target, Xbox Live, PlayStation Network, as long as you buy it, if you're Activision, they care that you buy it. And so xCloud and Stadia just give you another chance to buy it. So I think the winner really is the console uh, publishers 
and the second winner is the consumer because you don't have a barrier to entry. Next question from Sifted from Julian Reed 77 whether this upcoming generation or beyond with streaming services eating up the casual dollars due to price and convenience, will console manufacturers have to charge more for hardware to make up for those losses in installed base? Um, good question. Um, you know, I think the, the conclusion is right that they will sell fewer consoles. And that's really just because the console is not necessary. You know, so it, I mean, I guess it's like saying how many people need to buy a Blu-ray player. You know, you just don't need to anymore because you can pay per view, VOD, any movie made. Um, but you didn't see Sony raise the price of Blu-ray players. You know, they just make less profit. Um, so I think the probably the way that you'll see the console manufacturers address this is they will charge more for consoles, but they'll make them better and they'll differentiate them. So go back to kind of the Google Stadia service. The subscription service, 4K, high frame rate, costs 10 bucks a month. The free service, 1080p, low frame rate, is, is free. Um, so make a console that's 8K, you know, and 240 frames a second or some crazy, you know, speed. I mean, I don't know what they can do, probably not yet, but they're gonna do something 4K and 60 frames a second for sure and probably faster over time, and then get the super high-end consumer who wants the absolute best of the best of the best. And so the question is analogous to, does Porsche sell more cars than Toyota? No. Do they charge more? Yes. So the guy who wants a Porsche is gonna pay 100 grand for it, and the guy who wants a Toyota is gonna pay 30 grand for it, and I'm pretty sure there's a bigger profit on a $100,000 car than a $30,000 car. And you know, the, the Toyota, they might make 10,000 profit. The Porsche, they make way more than 10,000 profit, probably 25. You know, so they're giving you a much better engineered and more expensive to make car, but they charge for it. So that's what's gonna happen with consoles. And you know, I think ultimately maybe, you know, I, I think there's a limit to what you can charge for a console. Um, is it a thousand bucks? I doubt it. You know, so really, I don't know what they're going to do. I will tell you that I have good friends at Origin PC. They will make you a $3,000 gaming rig if you want one. And they don't get any better than what Origin puts together. Or you can buy a Dell XPS gaming computer for under 1000 And, you know, which one's better? Well, for sure, the Origin PC is better. But it costs more. And so I, I would say that uh, high price connotes high quality. I think that's true of Porsche versus Toyota. I think that's true of Origin PC versus Dell XPS. But, you know, some people will buy an Origin, but my guess is Dell sells more computers than Origin. So that's kind of what's going to happen with consoles. They will, there will be a high-end model. And I actually really think what you'll probably see is a console that's at 1000 bucks for the total hardcore guy and 400 for the masses. So they'll have the mass market console, much like you have the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X at the, in the marketplace at the same time, although I think the price differential will be greater. Our next question from Twitter from Matt, Matt Live SC or Matt Livesey, I don't know how to say his name. Will we see new VR headsets from Sony and Xbox? How important will they be in the next cycle? Could streaming be the key to making them wireless and therefore more mainstream, what other obstacles are keeping VR from taking off? Um, Microsoft hasn't done one yet that I know of. Uh, Sony obviously has. Um, wireless is real now with Oculus. They've got a new wireless headset. Um, Sony, my guess is they will absolutely launch one with the next generation console. Um, and I think that's the key to success. Um, the game experience is awesome, but the tethering is tough. And you know, when they designed PlayStation VR, I think the cord is six or 10 feet. It's really short. It's actually longer than that. It's like 12, it's, I think. Okay, it's not long enough for me because right. my PlayStation is built into the wall and I can't sit on my couch. So it's just annoying enough that I can't use it. And if they would just have an extension cord, I'd be happy, but they don't. Um, so I, I think they're learning, but I don't think tethering is a smart way to do it. Untethered is a better experience. So I would say Sony, 100% happening. Microsoft, I think not. I think Microsoft is focused on AR. 
I think they will allow others to deal, deal with VR. Um, I don't think they're important in the next cycle. I don't think uh, streaming has anything to do with making them wireless. Wireless is wireless and the headset has to talk to something and if it's talking to your TV or your internet router or your console, it's the same technology. I don't think it matters if it's streaming or not. Um, and actually the biggest obstacle is that the games have to be engineered for VR and that's a chicken and egg problem. Like if, if there's only a million VR headsets, then your addressable market's a million and you can't afford to make a game for 50 or 100 million bucks if you're only gonna sell a million copies. If there's a 100 million market for, for your game, you can afford to spend 100 million dollars to make it. And so I think VR games tend to be short and tend to be not particularly involved because they just can't justify the cost of making the game. Uh, when there are more headsets, there will be more games, and it's hard to sell headsets without games. So without a lot of games, people don't want to buy a headset. That's the problem. So the way to take it off, you know, make it take off is make wireless headsets that are cheap. Cheap as in under 100 bucks. You do that, then I think there'll be a lot of games. And I think ultimately maybe bundle it in with the console. This is a differentiator for the consoles, by the way. I think the he VR headset being a part of the console experience could keep us buying consoles. And I could see people doing that. But again, not this cycle. It'll be the next one. Our last question this week from Patreon from Nick Carney. Hey, Pac, we've heard stories of GameStop's impending doom for a while now. You recently said that new consoles having disk drives saved the company, but for how long? Will streaming services taking off doom the company for good? If so, why isn't GameStop leading this space when it's essential to its survival? I don't think they're doomed. Uh, I think that disk drives means they have another seven or eight years. Um, we're gonna take this cycle from 2013 to 2020, so the next cycle, 2020 to 2027. And so I think you will have disks around until 2027, and then we'll see if there is another cycle after that. Um, I agree that streaming is gonna take over a bigger portion of game sales, and digital downloads will take over a bigger portion of game sales. But we're still above 50% of games being purchased in physical form. And the reason that we're at that level is that there are a lot of gamers who value trading games in. There are a lot of gamers who get games as gifts. And again, you can give somebody a gift card or a digital download, but it's less personal than handing them something, wrapping it up under the tree. There are gamers who like to take their games to people's houses and, and play with their friends. There are gamers who like to give them away when they're done with them. That's me, actually, I give them away when I'm done. So, you know, there are a lot of benefits to physical. Those, many of those can be addressed with digital downloads. Like you can give a digital copy. If the publishers were willing to allow you to, you could take your digital copy to your friend's house if there's a quick sign-in mechanic. But no one's letting you sell them, you know, trade them back in for credit, so digital copies. Um, so I think, I think physical's gonna be here for at least seven or eight years. GameStop's going to be around. Their business will probably shrink by 40-50% over the next seven, eight years. And so the question is, who caves first? Does you know Walmart pull games off the shelf because it becomes so insignificant to them that it's not worth the shelf space? Target, same. You know, uh, other retailers, same. I think so. I think it's much like consumer electronics retailers as Amazon became a big deal. Um, consumer electronic sales didn't go down, but sales on Amazon went up a lot, and we lost Ultimate Electronics and Circuit City and Radio Shack, and Best Buy has managed to capture a lot of, of share and thrive in a shrinking market because they've added a ton of service, and they really do you know, deal with the, the consumer electronics consumer quite well. I think GameStop hired a bunch of Best Buy guys to run the company. I think they will manage the transition very well. I expect the stock to work. I have a $9 target on a $5 and change stock. I like it. Um, I don't love it, but I think it goes to nine. And five to nine is a good win for you. Um, if I was the management team, I would take the company private. And to be honest with you, it, they only have 102 million shares. At 550, they're only talking about 560 million to buy the company outright and they have about that much in cash on the balance sheet. They have some debt, but they could actually buy the company and go private tomorrow. 
So I, I frankly think that uh, it's an interesting investment and I think they're around for seven or eight years. And I think this management team is smart enough to figure out what to do. And you know, they'll have to close some stores. They'll have to figure out if there's other product categories they want to be in like collectibles. But I actually think they've got a decent asset base and a long enough uh, tail on physical to stay in business. So I don't think they're going away. Why don't they do streaming? Um, mostly because it's hard and mostly because it's a commodity. Um, you know, it's complicated and when OnLive kind of invented it, it was pretty impressive. Then Gaikai came in with completely different patents and completely different technology and came up with the same solution. And then Microsoft came up with the same solution, then Google came up with the same solution, and Amazon's gonna come up with the same solution, and God knows if they're using the same patents, but the point is, you got a lot of big guys who are going to participate. GameStop can't compete with them, even if they had the technology. Uh, so that's why, because it's you know, and I, and frankly, at the end of the day, I think it's just a commodity, and there's going to be a gajillion guys offering streaming, and it's going to be just like like I said, downloading a movie. You don't really care where you go to download it. Everybody can do it. Thank you if you're a Patreon patron patron. Thank you if you are linked and you're a Twitch Prime member and you've linked your Amazon account easy to do follow the instructions below thank you if you follow me on twitter at michael pactor and thank you if you are playing empires and puzzles and you joined my alliance achilles tm will be nice to you i promise and will help you get a lot of good free stuff um see you next week on the pactor factor